It permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. A very good afternoon to you and welcome to the show. I'm Vanessa Feltz. This is what's coming up. Our response teams are doing everything in our power to rescue and recover the victims of this collapse literally as we speak. Baltimore Bridge horror. Rescuers scramble to save people after the colossal key bridges collapses when a container ship crashed into it, sending multiple cars into the river. Plus, Brave Kate saves lives. The Princess of Wales' shock revelation that she's being treated for cancer inspires thousands of us to get checked. And bombshell Diddy lawsuit. Two properties owned by the rap music mogul Sean Coombs are searched by federal agents as part of an ongoing sex trafficking investigation. First of all, though, let's have the news headlines with Divya Kohli. Good afternoon. A huge rescue operation is underway to find six missing people after the Baltimore Bridge collapse. A state of emergency has been declared after it plunged into the river when a cargo ship crashed into it. Two people were rescued earlier. One was rushed to hospital. Live footage shows the scene right now. Baltimore's yeah. Mayor Brandon Scott was asked if the bridge would be rebuilt. He says it's too soon to say. The discussion right now should be about the people, the souls, the lives that we're trying to save. Uh, there will be a time to discuss about a bridge and how we get a bridge back up. But right now, there are people in the water that we have to get out. And that's the only thing we should be talking about. Here it's been confirmed the King will attend the Easter service at Windsor Castle. Buckingham Palace says His Majesty will be at St George's Chapel on Sunday with the Queen. The Prince and Princess of Wales will not be there as Kate continues. Julian Assange will have to wait to see if he can appeal against his extradition to the US. UK judges have sought further assurances on the WikiLeaks founder's case from the US and have ruled another hearing will be held in May. American prosecutors allege the 52-year-old helped Chelsea Manning steal military files that his site published. Fighting is continuing in the Gaza Strip despite a resolution passed by the UN Security Council for a ceasefire. It comes as the UK has airdropped food supplies into the region for the first time. The Royal Air Force parachuted more than 10 tonnes of aid, including water, rice and baby formula, to civilians. The Defence Secretary Grant Shapps has urged Israel to allow more aid into the war-torn territory. Hollywood actor Anne Hathaway has opened up about suffering a miscarriage while playing a pregnant woman in a play. The actor says during the six-week show she had to pretend everything was fine but said she was heartbroken when she had to give birth on stage every night. And an eight-foot statue of a gorilla stolen from a garden centre in Scotland has been found, but half of it's missing. The fibreglass beast was discovered in a lay-by a year after he was taken from his home in Lanarkshire. Its owner says he's sad Gary the gorilla has been sawn in two, but hopes to soon find its better half. That's the latest weather time now with Nazneen Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, a little bit of everything out there for this afternoon. If we take a look at the earlier satellite and radar picture, we can see areas of rain across the southwest that will be steadily moving northwards and also another batch of wet weather across northern areas. Now, the uh, showers across parts of eastern Scotland are turning wintry where the cold air is sitting there, mainly around the Aberdeenshire area. Meanwhile, further south, it's areas of rain across parts of the east of Wales and Midlands, central, southern and eastern England for this afternoon. To the southwest of England and Wales, though, there will be some sunshine and for parts 
parts of northeast England too, a bit of brightness. For Northern Ireland, on the other hand, though, it's becoming increasingly cloudy and wet, and that band of rain will continue to steadily move its way northwards overnight, hitting that cold air across Scotland, turning to snow, mostly across the high ground of central, southern and eastern Scotland. Meanwhile, rain will arrive across northern England by the early hours of the morning, and it will be wet through the night across Northern Ireland, and another batch of wet weather will head down towards parts of the southwest by the early hours of the morning, mostly dry and clear elsewhere. Tomorrow, both areas of rain will continue their journey further northward, so a wet afternoon for Scotland with hill snow there, Northern Ireland and the southwest of England and Wales. The north and east of England will see a bit of brightness at times. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Many thanks to Divya and to Nazanin. Let's move directly now to our top story. A state of emergency has been declared in the US state of Baltimore, with six people still unaccounted for after a major bridge collapsed into a river early this morning. A huge search operation is now underway for those who are missing. They're believed to be part of a construction crew working on the Francis Scott Key Bridge at the time of the incident. Officials say two people have already been found. One was taken to hospital and the other was uninjured. This all happened when a cargo ship which was trying to pass through the bridge hit one of the columns holding the bridge up that led to the 1.6 mile long structure snapping and plunging into the Palapsco River at high speed in a press conference in the last couple of hours the governor of Maryland declared our state is in shock and our response teams are doing everything in our power to rescue and recover the victims of this collapse literally as we speak. People who, as we speak, are out there are divers, our air assets, people who right now are working to save lives and are doing it because the state asked. I recognize that many of us are hurting right now. I recognize that many of us are scared right now. And so I want to be very clear about where everything stands. We are still investigating what happened, but we are quickly gathering details. The preliminary investigation points to an accident. We haven't seen any credible evidence of a terrorist attack. Joining me now are Harriet Alexander, the senior US features reporter for The Times, Sean Keyes, who's the managing director of Sutcliffe, a civil engineering firm, and the former director of the Irish Coast Guard, Chris Reynolds. Thank you all very much indeed for joining me. Why don't we start with Harriet, who can just, I hope, set the scene and explain how such an extraordinary thing, or at least it seems extraordinary, maybe you gentlemen will go on to say it isn't, but to, to all people watching this film, it's quite remarkable. Harriet, how such a thing could possibly have occurred? Well, what we know so far is that uh, this ship, it's a fairly large vessel. It's about 948 feet long. Um, it left the harbour 20 minutes before uh, the, the collision um, and it was uh, bound for Sri Lanka. Um, it, was under, it was being piloted um, and it's believed that it actually lost power just moments before it collided with this pylon that was supporting the bridge. Um, and they were able to give a mayday call, which it seems like has saved an awful lot of lives. And can you explain how the call saved lives? I understand that it led to people being stopped from driving onto the bridge. Is that what happened? Yes, yes, that's right. So this is a very busy ring road. Um, it goes all around the set, around Baltimore itself. Uh, but it did happen at twenty past one in the morning, um, which I think was a real a real godsend because mm. it stopped it being uh, so busy as it would be normally. So yes, they did close down parts of the bridge, and that uh, prevented it from being a far worse tragedy. So, so are we believing at this point, Harriet, that the pilots, the two of them who were piloting this ship? through lost control somehow or they didn't see the pylon or what do we think could have happened to cause this we think yes that they actually did lose power uh, and that would mean that they lost the steering of this um, of course something of this size is is incredibly difficult to maneuver and, and if you lose the power there's very little that you actually can do um, so that is what what the thinking is for now that it was a problem with the power this does happen it shouldn't happen 
Uh, but this is what we believe to be the case now. And what's clear is that there were construction teams working on the bridge, and as you correctly point out, it was the middle of the night, so that was the safest and best time for work to be done on the bridge, but they're very clear and keen to point out, aren't they, that it had nothing to do with the construction of the bridge, only kind of maintenance was going on. Yes, yes, that's right. So uh, two people have been rescued from the water. Uh, one of them was described as being in a very serious condition and has been taken to hospital. Um, the other person was was OK and said that he didn't need to go to hospital. Um, and yes, there were construction crews there. The six people who are believed to be missing, we do think are construction workers. Uh, but yes, I mean, this bridge was up to code, the authorities have said. Uh, it was built in the 1970s, but that doesn't make it particularly old. Uh, there's not known to be any real issues with the bridge, so it was just one of these awful, awful uh, sort of circumstances all coming together. Let me bring Sean Keyes into this conversation. MD of Sutcliffe, which is a multidisciplinary firm of structural and civil engineers. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, Sean. Mm. Um, so we understand that this large vessel crashed at some speed into is it, is it correct to describe it as a column or what would you describe it as one of the crucial elements of the, of the, of the engineering of the bridge that was, that was effect, effectively supporting the bridge? Is that what happened? Yeah, I would describe it as a column and it's a support that uh, takes the whole weight of the bridge. I think one of the things that we're, we're, talk, we're talking about is uh -huh. that, is that the, it's the impact from the, the cargo ship is, is literally enormous. So a cargo ship... Uh, would, would weigh about 165,000 tons, which is, is is the equivalent of four, maybe four to 10,000 heavy goods vehicles hitting a structure at even at a relatively low speed. So I think it's the sheer weight of the of the the cargo ship hitting hitting the 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 pylon or the column uh, that's caused the problem. I think one of the words, Sean, that's kind of the most vivid and dramatic in all of the descriptions of what happened, and we can see it with our own eyes anyway, so you can kind of see the drama as it unfolds. It's quite an extraordinary spectacle to behold. But, but, but the word that's really kind of the most vivid and, I think, shocking is the word snapped. They keep saying, and the bridge snapped. And I think people just think, hang on, what? You know, in, in this day and age, I think the bridge is 47 years old. How, how yeah. can a bridge snap but you'll explain how does a bridge snap well, everything can snap and break it just depends how much you load it so in the in the uk we we design st structures particularly footbridges and smaller structures for accident loading that would equate to something like 50 tons so it, it, we would design uh, a bridge to be hit in the uk uh, over a over a road, for instance, and it can resist a force of fifty tons, which is enormous, like a heavy goods vehicle hitting it. But we're talking something here that's one hundred and sixty five thousand tons. Mm -hmm. So everything has a point at which it breaks, uh, and this bridge clearly wouldn't have been designed to be hit at any speed by a fully laden uh, cargo ship. So I, I, the, the word snap's not a very good word. The one thing that I'm not, un, I'm a little bit uncomfortable about mm. is the level of the uh, catastrophic collapse that the whole thing has, has collapsed as one support has collapsed. So when you look at the video, yeah. and I feel, I really feel for anybody who's been involved in this, uh, but you can see that three decks of the, of the, of the bridge collapse. Not just, it's not a localized failure, but it's. It's the two adjacent decks and the deck that's furthest away. So it's quite a, it's a huge length of bridge deck that's fallen into the river. So, so when you say you're not comfortable with it, what do you mean? Um, I wish the collapse had have been smaller. So, so, so I if, still if don't know what you mean. Do you feel that there's something awry or something that you? No, no, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, it's just. It's just ideally an engineer would design something that if it, get, if it has an accident mm. that you'd only get localised failures. Um, but I think the sheer size of the ship has meant that the effect has been, has had, has had a domino effect and it's caused an adjacent bay to fall. But right. what would have happened if this ship was much smaller? So if this had been just the, a normal uh, pilot's uh, ship or a smaller ship, th th there might have been some localised failures around the supports to the bridge but maybe the the deck didn't fall the whole deck didn't fall into the sea but it's just the sheer size of the cargo ship that's caused it to have this 
domino effect mm -hmm. and affect adjacent uh, bays. Um, let me bring in Chris Reynolds to the conversation, former director of the Irish Coast Guard. Chris, thank you for being here. Um, I believe there's a kind of protocol, certainly in in the United the United Kingdom, when it comes to guiding large vessels under bridges, and that the Coast Guard are perpetually involved in this. They're not just left to guide themselves in or have their crew guide them in. Is that correct? Generally speaking, that's correct. In confined waters, you have a vessel traffic system that will be controlled basically like an air traffic control system. Uh, there is, uh, in Baltimore, no similar system that I know of. Right. However, I have to say it wouldn't have made a difference in this position. Just looking at the uh, transponder details and the information that's available on CCTV, it's very clear that the ship lost its generators. It, losing generators lost steerage. It quickly recovered the generators and then lost them again very, very quickly. And then lost steerage very quickly. It then drifted hard to starboard. The captain went full of stern, but it was too late. So even under a uh, operational control of the vessel traffic system, that accident probably would have still happened. When you say, Chris, the ship lost its steerage, then it recovered its generators, then it lost it again, how, how yeah. common is it for a vessel of that size to lose steerage? Is that something that very yes, rarely happens very or rarely something happens that often happens? happens? It's something that shouldn't happen. Right. Uh, unfortunately, it does happen, and sitting ships I've been on, it has happened. Uh, and it's uh, the uh, National Transport uh, Investigation will look at all these issues, including the speed of the ship. Um, should the ship have dropped an anchor, like they would have a, a crew uh, close up in the forecastle that could let go an anchor really quickly. Mm. There's a whole lot of questions that will now be asked. Uh, but at the moment, uh, it's all about saving life right. and about and trying to recover life. those who've been lost. And, 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 as, and as Harriet says, I mean, the great good fortune in this tragedy and huge accident is, is the fact that it was a, a one something in the morning and that although, you know, six people in that freezing cold water is far too many people, it isn't, it isn't more people, right, right Sean? Because, uh, Chris, sorry, Chris, because, you yes. know, imagine if yeah. apparently 35,000 people drive across that bridge as a kind of arterial road into and out of Baltimore every day. There have been similar accidents where over 40 people have died in that sort of scenario. But just as a general point, in my car, I've always carried, because what happens is your car falls into the water. And with modern cars, your, your battery will shut, your windows will shut, and you can't get out of the car. So in every car I have ever had, I carry a small waterproof torch in the glove compartment and a small tool to break the window to get out. So if anything is to be taken by your listeners from this is that you should all have a small waterproof torch in your glove compartment and a small window breaker in your glove compartment because we never know what could happen. What does a window breaker look like? Like a hammer? No, it's like a little uh, sharp tool, like a little spike at the end of a, uh, at the end of, a, at the end of a torch. My one is both a torch and a window breaker. Right. And it's like so, a sharp uh, spike. And you, and you personally keep that in your car in the event that you should, God forbid, plummet into some water, you would break the window and crawl out of the broken window. That's your plan. God, we should all do as you do. You're the, you're the former director of the Irish Coast Guard. Are you astounded that more people don't do this? Because I certainly haven't got anything of that kind in my car. I am. I'm afraid there's, we've had some really, really traumatic incidents where whole families have been lost when a car has slipped off a, a, a grassy slipway into the water and, and the whole family is lost because they can't get out of the car. So we certainly... It's a simple piece, very cheap piece of, of safety equipment that if you're, say, on that bridge and your car fell in the water and, and your electric shut down, mm. you can save yourself. And the torch, of course, will help as well. Gosh, I, I mean, I wasn't even going to ask you that. I didn't even think that was an issue. And I'm so glad that you have raised it. And I hope that people listening will take notice. I know I will, because um, what excellent advice that I had never been given before. I've never heard from anyone else. No one's ever pointed out. I wonder whether, uh, whether um, Sean does that, because as a, a, an engineer extraordinaire, he might well be aware of exactly the kind of perils of potentially falling into a water in your car I, I would actually i would have tools in the car not necessarily that i'm worried to fall off the bridge because that's an unusual uh, scenario but i would carry tools as an engineer but just to reinforce one of the points that was being made um 
on average, there was 20 cars a minute passing over this bridge during the day. Obviously, we were incredibly lucky. And I think the citizens of Baltimore will feel incredibly lucky. It was the middle of the night. Yeah. But 20 vehicles a minute. And you start to, to rack that up. And it, the, 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 they're really, really lucky that they managed to close the bridge down before before the, 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 the cargo ship hit it. I'm going to I'm going to ask you all the same question now because I'd be just interested in your take on on this. Um, the governor of Maryland, Wes Moore, says that the bridge will be rebuilt, and I quote, in a way that remembers the people this tragedy has impacted and honours the community it serves. So I'll start with Harriet. Harriet, what do you think that means exactly? How do you build a bridge in a way that commemorates those that have been lost and honours those who have been brave and you know somehow is is not just a bridge but a memorial? How do you do that? Well, actually, there's an interesting example from Florida, um, which was the last major situation like this. They're a container ship uh, crashed into a bridge near Tampa. That was in 1980. Um, 35 people were killed there. And what they did was they did rebuild several years later, but it wasn't exactly the same. They left the ruins of the bridge that collapsed. Uh, and they turn those into fishing piers for the local people to enjoy. So it's there, it's not forgotten, um, but the new bridge has been built with the most recent technology, and that's something they might look at. Sean Keyes, obviously the key thing in rebuilding the bridge is to make sure that nothing bashes into it and it doesn't fall, into, fall apart if it does. But are you going to tell me it's actually impossible to create such a bridge? No, I think I think the lessons will be learned, and it's far too early to say what the, all those lessons are. But there's a couple of obvious ones. Uh, um, th there is a history of uh, catastrophic uh, failures in in construction and engineering, and the fourth uh, bridge in the in the UK it was actually rebuilt. And the reason, one of the reasons it looks so substantial and strong, is because the previous one, and I think if my dates are correct in the 1880s collapsed, uh, or certainly the 1800s collapsed, and then they, they rebuilt it so it looked so much more robust. So I think that the next bridge will be considerably more robust than the previous one. And one thing I feel for the uh, citizens of Baltimore, we're probably talking 10 years before from start to finish. So this won't be back up and running for quite some time with a substantial cost associated to it. Right. Let me ask Chris Reynolds the same question. Chris, reconstructing the bridge in a way that's a fitting tribute, but also a memorial, but also, you know, is far safer in the future. Can you envisage how that will work? I, I think it's been said already, but the, the first thing I'd say is they have to clear what's there at the moment. And you have the ship caught underneath the bridge. It, ship looks doesn't look in too bad condition. Salvage should be fairly simple. Uh, but the port is blockaded uh, and it's a commercial, a huge commercial port. So the first thing they have to do is once the search and rescue uh, phase is over is to clear the, the uh, passageway to allow shipping carry on because a, a city and a country depends on shipping. Shipping is the lifeblood of every country. So unfortunately, phase one has to be clearing the current condition. Thank you all very much indeed for joining me. Bringing you some breaking news now. Conservative MP Robert Halfen has unexpectedly resigned as the Minister for Higher Education. In a letter to the Prime Minister, he said, I feel that it is time for me to step down at the forthcoming general election and in doing so to resign as a minister in your government. It makes him the 63rd Tory MP to announce that he or she is standing down at the next election. We'll have reaction to this breaking story later on in the show. Coming up after the break, the Princess of Wales's Brave Cancer video will save lives after inspiring thousands of people to get checked. I'm Vanessa Feltz and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man.
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Whirl, listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're that supposed to have was moved another on from that. era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. The Princess of Wales' shock revelation that she's being treated for cancer has inspired hundreds of thousands of us to get checked and will save lives. Both cancer charities and the NHS say they saw a huge surge in visitors to their websites following Friday's announcement. Joining me now in the studio to discuss it, Talk TV Royal Editor Sarah Hewson. Good to see you, Sarah. Thank you for coming in. Um, when we... I mean, we were together live on air on Talk TV uh, following Kate's announcement on Friday and the news was beginning to sink in and percolate. And I suppose one of the things that her great bravery has engendered in so many people is, is, is the desire to face up to the possibility that they might have a cancer diagnosis rather than doing what some people naturally do, which is just think, oh my God, I think I better not go to the doctor. I don't want to check this out. I think I'll ignore it. I'll ignore the symptoms. Yes, and also particularly for someone Kate's age, yes. 42, young, fit, healthy, you don't expect to get that kind of diagnosis mm. and that's why she described it as such a shock. But we are told now by the NHS and by various cancer charities that they did see a big surge in website traffic uh, following that. So Macmillan at Cancer Support saw 100,000 visits to their website between Friday night and Sunday night. Wow. So that's a 10% increase. The NHS website saw a five-fold increase in traffic to its cancer pages. And in particular, the page on cancer symptoms, one in every three seconds, somebody was clicking on that to look at the symptoms. Now, of course, we don't know what sort of Kate, cancer Kate has, so we're talking about general information uh, being searched out. But we did see a similar pattern after the King revealed yes. his diagnosis. And yesterday, Sarah Ferguson, the Duchess of York, who herself has uh, been going through double uh, cancer battles against... Uh, she had breast cancer and now uh, she's been treated for skin cancer as well. She praised uh, Kate for having the courage to come forward and she then said, you know, it will make a huge difference and it will save lives because somebody of her profile talking about it 
is hugely significant. I mean, it really is a very important contribution to make, isn't it? And certainly, you know, the King um, has been so specific about the enlarged prostate and then the cancer that was found that you can imagine men all over the country and all over the world thinking, well, hang on a minute, what were his symptoms? Let me just check. Oh, gosh, I better go and get myself sorted out. And if the King's undergoing treatment, then I can undergo treatment. It, 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 I mean, it is a, an, an sort of unexpectedly vivid way, in a way, for the royal family to make make a heck of a contribution to their subjects' lives and even longevity, a way that we hadn't necessarily thought of before. And it is unprecedented, yeah. isn't it, to have them talking in such a way about their medical diagnoses. Uh, and uh, Kate, we're told, was encouraged by the reaction from the public to the King speaking about his own diagnosis. Mm -hmm. She wanted to put that statement out there. She wanted to be upfront with the public. Uh, and she also felt that perhaps she could make a difference. And of course, the end of that statement, as we discussed at great length uh, on Friday after it, particularly uh, touching, I thought, when she said to other people who were going through this, you are not alone. Absolutely. And, and, uh, and we remember, you know, sort of great uptick and upsurge in, in people getting themselves checked out and getting treatment when, for example, Jade Goody was diagnosed yes. with cervical cancer and also when Kylie Minogue. Yes. was diagnosed with breast cancer. And we know that people all over the world did take their lead from them. So it can be very important. The Jade Goody effect was really remarkable because young women who wouldn't normally have gone and got themselves checked, wouldn't have gone for screening, yeah. suddenly thought, it could happen to me. I need to go for my regular screening. That was the same as Sarah Ferguson said about her breast cancer diagnosis. That was found at a routine mammogram screening uh, that she almost didn't go to. And so she spoke out to say, you must not miss these appointments. You really must make sure you take care of yourself because the best thing that you can do with cancer is to find it early. Yes. And that makes a huge difference in terms of the ability to treat it and, and your prognosis. Meanwhile, as we know, King Charles is being treated. We assume he's having chemotherapy. Um, but he has made the announcement that he will be attending church at Easter, which I'm assuming will be incredibly comforting to so many people who see him. Absolutely. So we've had confirmation from Buckingham Palace today that uh, King Charles will, alongside uh, Queen Camilla, be attending the Easter Sunday matin service at St George's Chapel on the Windsor Estate, along with other members of the family. Now, we don't know exactly who will be there, but we do know that the Prince and Princess of Wales won't be there. They've already announced that they're going to be spending uh, the Easter weekend privately with their family uh, following Kate's uh, cancer diagnosis. But I think it's a really good sign that the King is going to attend. We know Peter Phillips, his nephew, talked about how frustrated he is at not being able to get back to those public duties. He's been pushing to do a little bit more. Uh, we've seen him today uh, in the car being driven from Windsor Castle. He's also been meeting community faith leaders uh, today at Windsor. Um, but he's desperate to get back. There's a few important dates coming up in the calendar, which we'll have to uh, see about. One of them is the 80th anniversary of D-Day, mm -hmm. which will be hugely important for the royal family. Ascot, Trooping the Colour, all coming up in June. But this is very heartening because if he's pushing to do more, he must be feeling energetic, he must be feeling better, he must be, or he wouldn't be able to do more. Look, and I don't think he's perhaps going to be the easiest patient. Nobody has ever said that, and I think the Queen herself has said she's trying to, to keep him in check uh, on this. He certainly wants to get back uh, to work, but the fact that he is able to do something like going to church mm -hmm. uh, with members of the family on Easter Sunday... Uh, you know, will have been given medical advice that he's able to do that. I think that's a really encouraging and positive sign. Meanwhile, at the beginning of the programme at four o'clock, I said one of the stories that we're going to be covering today is P. Diddy and the investigation into various allegations of sexual impropriety, assault and various other things that have been levelled at him. I didn't necessarily think when I was announcing that that was coming up on the show that there'd be any link at all between that story and our royal family. But actually, as soon as you arrived in the studio, you told me that's not the case. Yes. Now, I should say from the outset, there's no, uh, absolutely no suggestion of any wrongdoing on the part of Prince Harry, but his name has been mentioned in this lawsuit against uh, Sean Coombs. Now, it's a 73-page uh, lawsuit. Uh, Prince Harry's name is mentioned once in it, and his name is used to suggest that uh, Sean Coombs, P. Diddy's associations with high-profile and influential figures, among them uh, Prince Harry, gave him some kind of 
legitimacy. Now, this photograph was taken in 2007 at the concert for Diana at Wembley Stadium, at Prince Harry there in the middle of Kanye West and uh, P. Diddy. We don't know actually whether there's been any further contact, what that relationship is like, whether there is in fact any kind of uh, lasting association uh, whatsoever, uh, but certainly, um, fascinating uh, reading and uh, Prince Harry said, won't, wanted his name to have been dragged up in such a lawsuit. And now we mention another member of the family who won't want his name dragged up but has absolutely no choice in the matter at all and that is Harry's uncle Prince Andrew who is the subject now of not just one but two forthcoming films. Yes, uh, about that uh, Newsnight interview, the infamous uh, Newsnight interview that uh, the Duke of York famously thought had gone well, uh, but in fact was an absolute disaster, yes. car crash interview, and that will be studied for years to come in terms of how not to do PR. Uh, the Netflix have a film coming out called Scoop on the 5th of April. And this is the story of Sam McAllister, the Newsnight booker, who managed to secure that interview uh, with Prince Andrew. And it, it tells a story behind the scenes, just went on, what went on. She tells a fascinating story mm. about those kind of meetings. I mean, I've interviewed her about it before, and she, she's, she's actually a lawyer. Yes, yeah, she's a lawyer so by trade. when she was watching the interview unfold in real life, in real time, she was using her legal brain to kind of assess every word that he said and uttered and could not believe the answers he was giving and had to show no flicker on her face, as Emily Maitlis brilliantly did as well, just a complete deadpan expression. And then when he asked Emily Maitlis if she'd like a tour of Buckingham Palace yes. after the interview, so oblivious to the fact that everyone was reeling from the, the kind of things that he had uh, said. Uh, and Sam McAllister talks about for days afterwards, mm. before it was aired, thinking they'll never let this go to air. Yeah. They will never let this go to air. And of course it did. And, and the what consequences do, what were does that huge. denote, though? Just a lack of insight, a lack of self-awareness, a lack Total of decent PR of who could have said, sir, you know, you, you may not realise, but actually when people hear you say Pizza Express and Woking, they're never going to let you forget that for the rest of your life. Uh, either nobody stood up to him, nobody wanted to tell him the truth. I mean, it's also fascinating when uh, Sam describes Princess Beatrice coming along yes. to one of the initial meetings about uh, the interview and, and how that changed her dynamic because she felt she couldn't necessarily ask him the same sort of questions as she might have done. And also, in front isn't of his it daughter. unusual to bring your daughter to a pre-interview when really the crux of the subject and the nub of what you're going to be discussing is your association with a convicted sex trafficker, Jeffrey Epstein, and you bring your daughter along? That's very strange too, isn't it? Yes, the whole thing is just completely bizarre. But it's out on uh, April the 5th, so it sees Gillian Anderson uh, playing Emily Maitlis. Billy Piper is playing uh, Sam McAllister. I, I mean, it, I think it will be very fascinating and watch then and excruciating, agonising uh, for uh, the royal family. So to go embarrassing back over an interview that I think they would all like to forget. And then there's another film on the same subject this time. Um, uh, produced by Emily Maitlis. Yes, yes, exactly. So two coming out. Uh, there is certainly no avoiding this uh, for the Duke of York. And uh, it just keeps on coming back mm. to haunt him, doesn't it? And it's true that straight after, well, two days, wasn't it, after the interview was broadcast, it was announced that he was withdrawing from royal duties or being taken away from royal duties. Yes, and then had all of his various responsibilities, his military affiliations, his patronages, they all went and and, and the rest is history. Mm. You know, he is now effectively in exile uh, in Royal Lodge in Windsor. He has no public role. Uh, we will see him, no doubt, on Easter Sunday. We were talking about which members of the royal family will be there. We will no doubt see uh, the Duke of York and uh, Sarah Ferguson and their daughters uh, attending at church uh, at uh, St George's Chapel because that's a family event yes. and that's different. Um, but when it comes to public events, then there is a very firm line taken by the king. When you say he's effectively an exile, which of course he is, but he's effectively also very present. We saw him at um, at, at the uh, memorial service for King Constantine, the one that yes. Prince William had to pull out of. And there was Andrew, as everybody said, you know, leading the family, prominently there, absolutely front and centre. That's another of instant where you think the PR advisors would have been head in hands. How did we? How did that happen? I think it was just a mistake in the fact that, uh, in the absence of Prince William, and then they all walked out of Windsor Castle to head down the hill to St George 
George's Chapel and he walked out first, but it's certainly not the image they want to portray when you had Prince Andrew leading uh, the royal family and European royals as well into the church for that memorial service for King Constantine of Greece. And do you think that the king, when he's well at least, you know, is, is kind of anguished and concerned and, and they discuss, you know, the Andrew problem and what to do about it? I mean, one of the things is, of course, he's occupying this, what is it, 27-bedroom mansion, he and Fergie rattling around, the occasional visit from the grandchildren. Well, we had a lot of talk uh, in the early days of the king's reign, didn't we, about the kind of changes that he might make and slimming down the monarchy and reducing the property portfolio, for example. And, and one of those, we talked about the Windsor Mansion merry-go-round, was whether he might boot Andrew out of, of Royal Lodge mm. and whether he would then take over Frogmore Cottage, which has been vacated by the Sussexes, and allow uh, William and Kate to take up residence at the larger Royal Lodge, Adelaide Cottage, a four-bedroom uh, property for them. That hasn't happened, and I think most of the talk of that has gone away. Andrew, pretty firm, he's got a lease, he's entitled to stay there, he's paid the bills, and uh, that is his home, and he's not moving. And, and as far as he is, his income, I mean, he was uh, a kind of trade on, on envoy and representative, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah. And he was, and he was, uh, you know, in receipt of, of of money from the kind of royal stipend that they. Yes, didn't and get. he's lost his allowance. Yeah. But he does have his inheritance from his mother, ah. uh, the late Queen, and and also Sarah Ferguson has been working very hard. But she's also a massive, um, a master of debt, isn't she? She's constantly she has been, but she has racking up debt. Turned that around, and she's now a very successful author among other things uh, and I think you know she's had to take on a lot of the responsibilities of, of footing the bills. Meanwhile we have various high profile particularly Hollywood and US celebrities and presenters and stars saying sorry for the mm. slurs that they caught that they that they um you know lambasted Kate with and one of them is Stephen Colbert who should have known better actually yes uh, and interesting because he actually had interviewed Prince Harry at the time uh, of his uh, book coming out um and uh, yes his uh, piece was particularly excruciating to watch. I found others, Blake Lively, who put out a statement saying, look, I'm sure nobody's really interested, it's not really what you want to hear, but I'm absolutely mortified yeah. because she'd done her own sort of photoshopped image mocking at the Princess of Wales. And I think that's a lot of the tone from the United States was mockery, was not recognising just how serious uh, this was and seeing it as, as just gossip. Yes. really gossip about the state of the marriage gossip about where kate was uh, you know there were even people selling t-shirts where's kate it became a whole industry and fodder really for late night chat shows right and and I, we noticed um, kim kardashian silent Yes, she says she's come under a lot of pressure uh, to apologise. As yet, I haven't seen no. any apology uh, from her, but she had posted that she was off to find Kate, uh, I believe. You know, as I said, everyone jumping onto that bandwagon as if it was some kind of, you know, big entertaining uh, prospect for them all, which, you know, was certainly the tone in the United States. But then when the news came and when the Princess of Wales put out her statement on Friday night. The United States, as everywhere around the world, reacting with complete shock and Absolutely. sympathy for her. So as Sarah and I were just discussing, two homes linked to the US rapper Sean Diddy Coombs have been reportedly raided by federal agents. In the court documents, Lil Rod also claims Diddy's affiliation to celebrities like Prince Harry gave him and his associates legitimacy. There's no suggestion, of course, of any wrongdoing on the prince's part. Joining us live from LA, showbiz reporter Kinsey Schofield. Uh, Kinsey, hello, thanks so much for joining us. Um, so this is a, a, an unexpected one, really, and maybe it's an incredibly tenuous link, but as Sarah Hughes and our All Editor has just been discussing, there is mention of Prince Harry in the Sean Coombs um, legal portfolio and scenario. So can you tell us what's going on, Kinsey? That's right. I mean, I think that ultimately Prince Harry's name is mentioned to show the type of influence that, um, you know, Sean Combs has here in the United States. He's so famous and he has so much power that he has the capability of um, attracting the, the type of people he does around him because he hangs out with people like Prince Harry. But the reality is, uh, you know, the last time these two individuals were photographed together was in 2007 at an after party after a concert 
for Princess Diana. The last time I can find P. Diddy talking about Prince Harry was in 2011 on the Graham Norton show, where he clearly has no relationship with Prince Harry whatsoever. Uh, joking about maybe in their heydays, he would have hung out with them. But now that Prince William was settling down with with Kate Middleton at the time, P. Diddy wasn't going to try to to get the boys in any more trouble. So I think that this was the accuser trying to, you know, elevate his case by using somebody that is clearly prominent and clickbaity uh, by utilizing Prince Harry's name. I don't think that Prince Harry in any sh way, shape or form should have been drug into this kind of chaos. On the other hand, I suppose we have the vista before us, Kinsey, of Prince Andrew being used by Jeffrey Epstein and exploited pretty shamelessly by Jeffrey Epstein to give him exactly what's being alleged in this case, which is a certain kind of legitimacy. You know, if you're hobnobbing with and fraternising with a prince of the royal blood, the queen's son, it gives you a kind of um, bona fide quality and status and a kind of prestige that you can only get by that kind of association. So when it's being alleged that that, that um, Sean Coombs's relationship, whatever that may be, it may be absolutely nothing, it may have been simply one photo opportunity, it may have been more, with Prince Harry, could have been used to convey a certain gravitas on P. Diddy. It's not utterly ridiculous, is it? It's pretty much in a similar vein. You get photographed with Prince Harry, it makes you look kosher, doesn't it? It does, um, but I would also argue that in 2007, P. Diddy was a, a much bigger player in the pop culture scene than Prince Harry was. And P. P. Diddy at the time, before any of these allegations, was doing the palace a huge favor uh, by participating in this concert for Princess Diana. Um, it, you know, I think that, um, yeah, again, I've worked with P. Diddy. I never had any issues with him. And I think that these allegations are horrible, but I don't think that Prince Harry should, it's not the same. Prince Andrew was friends with Jeffrey Epstein. He spent the night at his home. He flew to break up with him, They to, to break up their friendship. He says he flew over there to say goodbye to him. And I do think that this was something as simple as a one-off event that was photographed. And, and tell me a little more, because you and I were talking on Friday after um, the Princess of Wales announced the news of her cancer diagnosis and you were devastated and sobbing and, you know, we were all absolutely shocked to the core. Uh, what's the situation now in the US in terms of people feeling remorse about the... All right, we're going to leave you. We're going to go straight to President Biden now. Good afternoon. Before I leave for North Carolina, which I'm going to do in a few minutes, I want to speak briefly about the terrible incident and accident that happened in Baltimore this morning. At about 1.30, container ship struck the Francis Scott Key Bridge, which I've been over many, many times commuting from the state of Delaware and our trainer by car, been in Baltimore Harbor many times. And uh, the bridge collapsed, sending several people and vehicles into the water, into the river. And uh, multiple U.S. Coast Guard units, which are stationed very nearby, thank God, were immediately deployed along with local emergency personnel. And the Coast Guard is leading the response to the port, where representatives from the Federal Highway Administration, the FBI, the Department of Transportation, the Army Corps of Engineers, as well as Maryland officials and Baltimore police and fire are all working together to coordinate an emergency response. Officials at the scene estimate eight people were unaccounted for still not still, were unaccounted for. That number might change. Two have been rescued, one without injury, one in critical condition. And the search and rescue operation is continuing for all those remaining as we speak. I spoke with Governor Moore this morning, as well as the mayor of Baltimore, the county executive, United, to both United States senators and the congressman. And my secretary of transportation is on the scene. I told them we're going to send all the federal resources they need as we respond to this emergency. I mean, all the federal resources. And we're going to rebuild that port together. Everything so far indicates that this was a terrible accident. At this time, we have no other indication, no other reason to believe there's any intentional act here. Personnel on board the ship were able to alert the Maryland Department of Transportation that they had lost control of their vessel, as you all know and reported. As a result, local authorities were able to close the bridge to traffic before the bridge was struck, which undoubtedly saved lives. 
Our prayers are with everyone involved in this terrible accident and all the families, especially those waiting for the news of their loved one right now. I know every minute in that circumstance feels like a lifetime. You just don't know. It's just terrible. We're incredibly grateful for the brave rescuers who immediately rushed to the scene and to the people of Baltimore who want to say, we're with you. We're going to stay with you as long as it takes. And like the governor said, you're Maryland tough, you're Baltimore strong, and we're going to get through this together. And I promise we're not leaving. Here's what's happening now. The search and rescue operation is our top priority. Ship traffic in the Port of Baltimore has been suspended until further notice. And we'll need to clear that channel before the sh ship traffic can resume. The Army Corps of Engineers is on the spot and is going to help lead this effort to clear the channel. The Port of Baltimore is one of the nation's largest shipping hubs. And I've been there a number of times as a senator and as a vice president. It handles a record amount of cargo last year. It's also the top port in America for both imports and exports of automobiles and light trucks. Around 850,000 vehicles go through that port every single year. And we're going to get it up and running again as soon as possible. 15,000 jobs depend on that port. And we're going to do everything we can to protect those jobs and help those workers. The bridge is also critical to, for travel, not just for Baltimore, but for the Northeast Corridor. Over 30,000 vehicles cross the Francis Scott Key Bridge on a daily basis. <clears throat> it's virtually, uh, well, it's a, well, it's one of the most important elements for the economy in the Northeast and the quality of life. My transportation secretary is there now. As I told Governor Moore, I've directed my team to move heaven and earth to reopen the port and rebuild the bridge as soon as humanly possible. And we're going to work hand in hand with the support of Maryland to support Maryland whatever they ask for. We're going to work with our partners in Congress to make sure the state gets the support it needs. It's my intention that federal government will pay for the entire cost of reconstructing that bridge. And I expect to, the Congress to support my effort. This is going to take some time. The people of Baltimore can count on us, though, to stick with them at every step of the way until the port is reopened and the bridge is rebuilt. You know, we're not leaving until this job gets done not leave until then. So I just want to say God bless everybody who uh, got everyone harmed this morning and their families. And may God bless the first responders, many of whom risk in their lives. And uh, I'm going to, the reason I'm not going to take a lot of questions, there's remaining issues that are open that we've got to determine what's going to happen in terms of the, the rescue mission and the like. But I'll do you plan to go to Baltimore, sir? And if so, how quickly? I do, and as quickly as I can. You said the federal government's also going to pay for the repairs. I'm just curious. This was a ship that appears to be at fault. Is there any reason to believe that the company behind the ship should be held responsible? And then also, you that mentioned could be, but we're not going to wait for that happen. We're going to pay for it to get the bridge rebuilt and open. What did you make Mr. of Israel's Biden. decision not to attend this meeting this week? Oh, I don't want to get into We've got plenty Rafa. of time to talk about. You mentioned the port. Uh, the port. Can I ask about cars? About the port. We will, of course, bring you plenty more on this story in the next hour of the show. But first, a Moscow court has ordered Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovitz to remain in jail on espionage charges until at least late June. Friday will mark a year since the 32-year-old US citizen was arrested in Russia while on a reporting trip. Gershkovitz and his employer strongly deny the spying charges, while Washington maintains he's being wrongfully detained. Evan Gershkovitz is being held at Moscow goes Le Fonovo prison, which is notorious for its harsh conditions, and it if he's ultimately convicted, he faces up to 20 years in jail. Washington's pledged to do whatever it takes to bring Evan home. The US ambassador in Moscow says he's being used as a political pawn by the Kremlin. Joining me in the studio now is chief uh, digital editor at the Wall Street Journal, Gornia McCarthy. Thank you for being here. Just tell people what's going on. I can't believe we're still talking about this. I can't believe he's still there. It's going to mark, mark one year on Friday. March 29th, one year of his life in prison. He turned 32 in prison. He has missed so much. And we saw him in court this morning. He was in uh, Moscow City Court this morning, um, at which uh, the decision was made by the judge to extend his pretrial detention by another three months, mm. which will bring it up to the end of June. That's the fifth time his detention has been extended in this uh, bogus legal process in Russia. 
Um, and so Evan, uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's there for, we're going to mark a year this week, and it's kind of astounding. What, what is the Kremlin, do you think, trying to achieve? What do they want to bargain for or bar to him for? What are they trying to do? I mean, I guess it's only really in President Vla Vladimir Putin's head, but um, we have seen some sort of signs in recent times, including before Christmas at a press conference that Putin gave when he was asked about Evan, and uh, another press conference uh, he's given since and an interview that he gave where he did seem open to pursuing a deal. Um, I mean, the playbook that we imagine will happen is that Evan will be swapped for um, somebody that Putin wants back. Mm. We've seen some track record of this um, happening with others. Um, so he really is just a pawn um, and this kind of hostage diplomacy, which Putin seems emboldened to continue with. I remember asking you this months ago, but I'm going to ask you again. Describe Evan. What kind of a chap is he? What's he like? What does he enjoy? What's his personality like? He's extremely gregarious. He's the type of guy you'd look around in the evening. He works in this building um, when he was in London. Um, he would still be there. Then you'd go to the pub for a drink with him. He's, a, he's real, uh, in, really into his food. He's a great chef. He's a great football player. He supports Arsenal. He's a massive Arsenal fan. Um, I'm trying to convince people to support Arsenal just for Evan. I'm not really a football person. But um, he is one of those, one of his friends described him to me as a friend magnet. He is such a connector of people. And it's been really astonishing to see, even while in prison, his friends rallying around him. Um, he's just an all-American boy, as his mother describes him. Very, very talented journalist. Very kind of interesting person, interested in the world. And are there any influential or powerful or notable people who are sort of lobbying for him and trying to attract attention on his behalf? I know we've seen a lot of grassroots um, efforts at the art by the Arsenal fans who have um, held up banners free Evan at Arsenal games. And I know that's gotten back to him and that he's taking heart from that. He is trying to follow the season um, from this horrible prison in, in Moscow. But really, the message that we have is that everyone should support Evan because it's not just about a free press, it's about a free society. And very briefly, how do you want people to do it? Uh, write to him, freegershkovich at gmail.com um, and talk about him and, you know, write about him and just keep him in the public eye. Do you feel hopeful or do you feel less hope with every, every week that goes by? I'm naturally an optimistic person and I am holding on to that optimism. Well, that's quite difficult to do, isn't it? Yeah, it must be it agonizing difficult. for his family. It's very difficult for his family. It's very difficult for all of us. But every time I think about how difficult it is, it's so much more difficult for him. It certainly is. Are they at least being kind and decent to him? Yeah, I mean, he's in a he's in he's not in a very nice place. It's he's in a tiny cell. He's sharing, he's got a cellmate. Um, he's locked in that room for pretty much 23 of 24 hours. So he's doing as best as he can. Thank you so much for coming in again. I hope I don't have to see you at the same time, heaven forbid, next year. Here's to coming, that. Yes, coming up after the break, we'll have the very latest from the frantic search for six people who are still missing after a bridge collapsed in Baltimore. I'm Vanessa Feltz and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kingston City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. But you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> there was a suggestion by some 
that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, uh, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got laughs> just yeah. for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to it was another that. era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. A very warm welcome back to the show, so please have your company this afternoon. I'm Vanessa Feltz, and this is what's coming up this hour. Our response teams are doing everything in our power to rescue and recover the victims of this collapse, literally as we speak. Baltimore Bridge horror. Rescuers scramble to save people after the colossal key bridge collapses when a container ship crashed into it, sending multiple cars into the river. Plus, the cost of care. TV presenter Kate Garraway reveals her huge debts after caring for her late husband as she promises to shine a light on the underfunded care system. And running out of dough. Pizza giant Papa John's will shut 43 underperforming restaurants across Britain after launching a review at the start of the year. First of all, though, let's have the news headlines with Divya Kohli. Good afternoon. U.S. President Joe Biden has promised to provide all federal resources following the Baltimore Bridge collapse. Two people have been rescued as a major operation continues. One of them is in a critical condition. The bridge collapsed when a cargo ship crashed into it after reports it lost power. Live footage shows the scene right now. Civil engineer Sean Keyes told Vanessa the impact from a cargo ship hitting the bridge would have been enormous. So a cargo ship uh, would weigh about 165,000 tons, which is is the equivalent of four, maybe four to 10,000 heavy goods vehicles hitting a structure at even at a relatively low speed. So I think it's the sheer weight of the of the the cargo ship hitting hitting the 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 pylon or the column. In the last hour, Conservative Minister Robert Halfen has quit his government role in the Education Department. He will also be stepping down as an MP for Harlow at the general election. Mr Halfon announced his resignation in a letter to the Prime Minister on the social media site X. The Armed Forces Minister James Heapy also quit earlier today. It's been confirmed the King will attend the Easter service at Windsor Castle. Buckingham Palace says His Majesty will be at St George's Chapel on Sunday with the Queen. The Prince and Princess of Wales will not be there as Kate continues her cancer treatment. Julian Assange will have to wait to see if he can appeal against his extradition to the US. UK judges have sought further assurances on the WikiLeaks founder's case from the US and have ruled another hearing will be held in May. American prosecutors allege the 52-year-old helped Chelsea Manning steal military files that his site published. Fighting is continuing in the Gaza Strip despite a resolution passed by the UN Security Council for a ceasefire. It comes as the UK has airdropped food supplies into the region for the first time. The Royal Air Force parachuted more than 10 tonnes of aid, including water, rice and baby formula, to civilians. 
And nearly four million smart meters across the UK aren't working properly, according to government data. 2.7 million meters weren't operating in smart mode last summer, but that rose to 3.98 million by the end of the year. Users can be overcharged if there are connection problems. That's the latest weather time now with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. There was a bit of sunshine out there today, mainly across the southwest of England and Wales, where there was rain first thing in the morning. That rain will have moved northwards through the day across parts of Northern Ireland. And also there was another batch of wet weather that has been rather persistent through today across the eastern parts of Wales, the Midlands, central, southern and eastern England. Now, that rain steadily moves its way northwards through tonight up towards Scotland, where there's cold air. And as it hits that cold air, there's likely to be snow across the high ground of central, southern and eastern Scotland. Meanwhile, Northern Ireland will see spells of rain and Northern England. Further south will be mostly dry and clear, but the southwest will see another batch of wet weather spreading through by the early hours of the morning. And both areas of rain will continue spreading northwards through tomorrow, eventually becoming confined towards parts of Scotland, Northern Ireland, uh, the east of Wales, the Midlands and the southeast of England. Either side of that, there will be a bit of brightness here and there. Temperatures will be around average for the time of year. Wednesday sees the rain clear, but then it's a case of sunshine and showers for the rest of the week. Rather windy conditions through Wednesday and Thursday, but as we head into Easter weekend, the winds will become lighter, but there will still be the risk of some showers. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Many thanks to Divya and to Nazanin. Let's move directly now to our top story today. A state of emergency has been declared in the US state of Baltimore, with six people still unaccounted for after a major bridge collapsed into a river early this morning. A huge search operation is now underway for those who are missing. They're believed to be part of a construction crew working on the Francis Scott Key Bridge at the time of the incident. Officials say two people have already been found. One was taken to hospital and the other was uninjured. This all happened when a cargo ship, which was trying to pass through the bridge, hit one of the columns holding the bridge up. That led to the 1.6 mile long structure snapping and plunging into the Patapsco River River at high speed. In the last half an hour, President Biden said he will move heaven and earth to reopen the port. We're going to send all the federal resources they need as we respond to this emergency. And I mean all the federal resources. And we're going to rebuild that port together. Everything so far indicates that this was a terrible accident. At this time, we have no other indication, no other reason to believe there's any intentional act here. Personnel on board the ship were able to alert the Maryland Department of Transportation that they had lost control of their vessel, as you all know and reported. As a result, local authorities were able to close the bridge to traffic before the bridge was struck, which undoubtedly saved lives. Joining me to discuss this tragic accident, it seems, is Harriet Alexander, the senior US features reporter for The Times. Harriet, thank you so much for joining us again today. I mean, this is something that once you've actually seen the film footage, you cannot take your eyes off. It looks like a, a, a scene from a disaster movie, a very expensive one that's been very carefully staged and filmed, but actually it's happened in real life. It's almost unbelievable watching it. Now, they're going to be some people, Harriet, who haven't seen it today and are listening to this on the radio. So I'm relying on your cinematic powers of description to convey to them just what an, an extraordinary cataclysmic collision this really is. Well, yes, you're, you're right. The, uh, the mayor of Baltimore said that it was like something out of uh, a disaster film. And he's not wrong. I mean, it's just incredible to see this huge construction of, of steel just come plummeting down into the water um, as this cruise, as this cargo ship is, is underneath it. Um, and actually, when you watch the footage of it quite carefully, you can see what is going on in the sense that there is a big puff of smoke from the, uh, from the container ship. The lights seem to flicker and then go out. Um, they momentarily come back on, but that's when it begins to veer off course. And that's what we think is what happened, that the power was lost. And that, of course, means that the steering goes out 
and that's what caused it to, to collide with the pillar and bring the bridge crashing down. And we believe that really it was the sheer, gigantic, voluminous weight of the ship. It was such a huge vessel that the collision was catastrophic in that no bridge would be able to withstand that level of, of force. That's right, yes, yes. There's no suggestion so far that, that there was um, any problem with the bridge um, or whether there was any issues with the vessel itself. Um, they do lose power every now and then. I mean, it shouldn't happen, but it's not unheard of. Um, it was being piloted by a local crew. There was two pilots on board and that's standard. That's what you do is that you have people who are expert in those particular waters um, who will help navigate uh, through the harbour. And then when you get out onto the open seas, it's just the crew that takes control. Um, so there's nothing untoward so far. It just seems like it was awful timing, which caused this astonishing and really quite devastating scene. And then, as you pointed out earlier on my programme, Harriet, when we spoke to you at the beginning of the programme, there was also, there was the most awful timing, but also excellent timing in that when this happened, it was at 1am-ish in the morning and the bridge was not full of traffic. Right, absolutely. And this is a really busy bridge. Um, the route, for those who don't, who don't know Baltimore well, it's, it's essentially the ring road for Baltimore. So it's a very busy bridge. Huge amounts of traffic over it um, throughout the day and night. But thankfully, because it happened at 1.30 in the morning, 1.20, um, uh, there was not heavy traffic. And what was incredibly important, and, and Joe Biden stressed this just a minute ago, was that the authorities in Baltimore were really quick thinking and they closed the bridge as soon as the crew said, we have a problem here. Uh, and, and now we have still six people missing in this freezing cold river because we've been given the temperatures of the water and my goodness, it's absolutely perishing down there, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the air temperature is very cold. Um, I'm in New York, but Baltimore is not that far away. It is cold here. Uh, the water is very cold as well. People will not survive long in that water, which is what's forefront of everybody's minds right now. So six people are still missing, uh, construction workers who are on the bridge at the time, um, and they are really racing against time, using everything at their disposal uh, to try and see if they can find and save these people. And President Biden has spoken and he says he'll be going to Baltimore with all due speed. Maybe you can summarise a little of, of, of the rest of the speech that he's just made, Harriet. Yes, yes. So, so one thing that's interesting is that he says that the federal government will cover all of the costs of rebuilding this bridge. Um, Joe Biden has made quite a big thing of infrastructure. He really prides himself on getting it done. Um, he said he wants Congress to support him in this plan and push it through. Um, he was asked whether the ship company will be held liable. He said it was too early to talk about that and he didn't want to wait. He wanted, as, as he said, to move heaven and earth to get the port reopened, to get things back up and running um, and to show the people of Baltimore that the federal government was really with them. And yet, when you and I last spoke only an hour ago, we had a former head of the Coast Guard, the Irish Coast Guard, on the programme with you. And also, we had um, a, a chief engineer of a, a very well-known international construction company. And both said that this is a huge job. In fact, we were warned that this might take as long as 10 years to be completed uh, before a single car does get to go over that bridge again. Yes, I, I think that sounds that sounds right. I mean, these things do take an awful amount of time, but I think Biden is really signaling that he wants to prioritise this, that he wants to make it happen. Of course, we've got the election coming up in November, so it might not be him in power, um, but he certainly feels that this is something that should be prioritised. It's a very important route for Baltimore. It's a busy city, and, and you know, the way that Baltimore is located in the US, um, you have Philadelphia, D.C see just down the road, New York, not far away. It's a really, really clogged um, artery. And so they will want to get this rebuilt as soon as possible um, to try and push, you know, keep Baltimore alive and thriving. 
I think we should also use the opportunity, Harriet, to echo the sentiments of um, the former chief of the Irish Coast Guard, who was my guest earlier. And the reason I'm, I, I want to repeat this is because I think it's important that we all do take on board this information, not information I'd ever been given before. He said that the design of modern cars means that if your car plummets into water, everything closes down, the doors lock, the boot locks, you can't get out of the car. So he recommends what he himself does, which is always to keep in the car, A, a torch, and B, a sharp tool with which you can break the window so at least you stand some chance of escaping. I mean, I'd never even thought of that, had you? No, no, not at all, actually. I was just taking note of that. I thought that's really good advice. And interestingly, here in the US, we had a high profile case last month of um, a billionaire woman who uh, is the sister of a, a very high profile politician here. Her Tesla uh, reversed into a pond on the estate, the 900 acre estate she has in Texas. And she drowned inside that car because she couldn't get out. Mm. Uh, and that made a lot of us think about how you should quickly open the windows as soon as a car goes into water. So it's a very relevant uh, for all walks of life and very important advice, I think. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the programme, Harriet. It's greatly appreciated. Coming up after the break, Rishi Sunak is grilled by senior MPs over the economy, the Rwanda scheme, TikTok and defence spending too. I'm Vanessa Feltz and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat, oh. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. 
Rishi Sunak's defended the UK's approach to dealing with China as he argued it's undoubtedly more robust than most of our allies. Appearing in front of the Liaison Committee for the first time since December, the Prime Minister said that China had engaged in behaviour which the UK and its allies will not stand for, referring to the recent news about cyber attacks. During the 90-minute session, he was also quizzed about the government's Rwanda plan and whether it really is safe. Today also just happens to be the last day that Rishi Sunak could go to Buckingham Palace and ask the king to dissolve Parliament for a general election to take place on the 2nd of May. It's very unlikely, but as they say, you never know what might happen in politics. Joining me now in the studio, political commentator Mike Buckley. Good to see you, Mike. Former Tory advisor Charlie Rowley. Hi, Charlie. And political journalist Michael Crick. God, we've got the big guns in today. Nice to see you all, you three. What a trio. What a phenomenal trio. Why don't we kick off with the combined news that... It's probably too late now for Rishi Sunak to go to the palace and call for a general election on May the 2nd because he's just about lost his chance. It elapses today. But the breaking news that happened during the first hour of my programme, which is that Robert Halfon has thrown in the towel. He's sent the Prime Minister his letter of resignation. Robert Halfon, if people aren't sure who he is, skills, apprenticeships and higher education minister... The 63rd, we think, um, chap to resign from... Uh, or chap, chap or woman to resign um, before the general election takes place, meaning another by-election is essential. I might start with Charlie. Why not, Charlie? Um, Robert Halfung, goodbye, adieu, farewell. Yeah, and he'll be a very sad loss to the Conservative Party. He's been a great man. He's been a great MP. He won Harlow, not an easy uh, place to win for Conservatives, so he did extremely well to win that seat. I think he went on to be... Uh, vice chairman, deputy chairman of the Conservative Party, to lead the campaigns, the local campaigns. He was an avid campaigner, mm -hmm. always popping up on the backbenches to um, uh, make sure the Chancellor continues to cut that fuel duty uh, for hardworking sort of uh, drivers. So he has been um, a stalwart when it comes to Conservative Party politics, for campaigning, uh, for winning elections. Uh, and it'll be um, uh, very, very sad to see him, see him go. OK, that's not the end of the conversation. Obviously, why is he doing it? Why a 63? Why is he number 63 in a long line of people doing the same thing. What's happening here? Describe, explain. Well, I think he's obviously decided that he won't stand at the next election. So I think uh, maybe he just wants to give, obviously, everybody enough time as possible. And I think we heard uh, just a few weeks ago that CCHQ would rather, and uh, whether it's a, um, a diktat or just a, um, a hopeful mm -hmm. uh, plan to make sure that you don't have uh, uh, many, many more MPs sort of just resigning or throwing in the towel at the same time. People are staggering their sort of uh, a departure just to make sure that the party machine can sort of focus on uh, batches rather than lots of people at any one given time. Uh, that's one particular theory. But right. um, I think Rob has obviously decided that now is the right time, uh, probably in the run-up to Easter, to let his constituents know that he won't be standing again and um, is uh, standing down from, from Parliament. Michael Quick, so this, this trickle shouldn't become a flood, but what are they doing? Is this the feathering of nests that we can see and hear? Is this, is this Tories res rescuing themselves, saving themselves from the lifeboats well in advance so they can get another lucrative gig fixed up before their downfall? They just can't face the downfall, so they're not going to do it? They're opting out first? Well, I mean, Obviously, people can see, and that's probably true of Robert Halfon, that they're going to lose their seat. Mm. Um, and uh, the, so the, the, it's, uh, it's simpler to go now, right, announce it now, than go through the humiliation of losing uh, your seat. I mean, he will be a loss. I mean, the thing about Halfon was he was a great champion for working-class uh, people in the Conservative Party... Uh, really ahead of all the sort of Boris Johnson red wall stuff. Mm. I mean, I disagree with him on fuel duty. I think that's terribly damaging. Uh, but I'm a huge admirer of his as a minister and, of course, disabled as well, one of the few disabled politicians. He's been higher education minister, a good higher education minister. And, goodness, we have so many higher education ministers. They keep for universities. You know, how are we meant to look after the universities when you treat them like that? In terms of the 63, mm. well, it, that figure is arguable how many it is, but somewhere between 60 and 70 Conservative MPs so far have announced their resignation. Yes. You'd sort of expect the number would be pretty high after four and a half years since the last general election. Uh, and it may not be as high, for example, as the number of Labour MPs who stood down before the 2010 election, mm. which reached exactly 100. And that was in a parliamentary party the similar size to the Conservatives now. So I don't suspect... I don't think the Conservatives will get to 100, but I do think we can probably expect two or a couple of dozen, maybe 30 more to do so. Uh, maybe it's graduated by the whips. On the other hand, I think the high command 
would quite like it if quite a few of them did resign at the very end, because then they can say, right, we haven't got time to have a proper selection process, so we're going to put in our favoured son here or, or our favoured advisor, and the local party will have to lump it. Uh, that's, those are some of the machinations that sometimes oh, right. go on. So, so Mike Buckley, yeah. if you're a serving politician and if you believe in the cause and the philosophy and the party and the importance of what you're doing and you think it's a noble calling and you, with every particle of your body you think it's a vocation, what's all this resigning business? Why don't you owe it to the party, to yourself, to your career, to your, to your constituents to see it through to the bitter end and should you fail, you fail, but you fail nobly and you fail still trying and you're still valiantly serving, you don't just pack it in, do you? There is an argument for that. I mean, some of them, to be fair, are approaching retirement age, and so it's perfectly reasonable if somebody's approaching 65 or 70 or 75 in some cases to think, you know what, I've done my bit, mm. I'm going to stand down, it's time for somebody else, that's all fine. But, of course, this time, on the, particularly on the Conservative side, we've got a lot of much younger MPs, many of them only went in in 2019, yeah. who announced, in some cases, quite a long time ago, they weren't going to fight in the next election. This is simply rats leaving a sinking ship. You know, they can see the disaster that's coming from the Conservative Party. They can see there's a big Labour win, almost certainly, in coming if the polls are to be believed. And they think, I don't want to be part of that. I want to announce now. I am very sceptical, by the way, that the Conservative Party HQ is happy with this piecemeal, one every few weeks thing, because it's a recurrent bad news story. Mm. Every time it comes out, it's a Conservative MP saying, I do not have confidence in Rishi Sunak or confidence we can win the next election. So it's, it's a bad news story every few weeks, I suspect. As Michael said, they'd much rather wait until the, the last minute. They all did it in a heat where nobody, the news cycle, didn't care because we were into a general election. Mm -hmm. And then, as Michael said, they can post in their favourite So is there a kind of... Could there be, Charlie, you know, the machinations of this kind of thing behind the scenes? Is there some kind of, uh, you know, caucus or phalanx of people charging about to would-be resigners saying, mate, don't, just hang in a bit, will you? Just wait. You know, OK, it's not going to be the, the general election's on May the 2nd, but it won't be that much further away. It's got to be this year, so do me a favour, mate, please. Don't do this. It's embarrassing. And as Mike quite rightly says, it's a it's a it's a rubbish story for us and it keeps on happening. Wait till the end. And then as as Michael Crick says, we can just shove in whoever we like and it won't be you. All right, just hang in. Where's the bit where they pressure them? Is it because they can't, because they can't offer any, there's no bargain anymore. They can't say if you do this, if you wait will kick you up to the to the upper house because look what happened with Nadine Doris, formerly of this parish, who never got to be kicked anywhere. Is it they can't offer them a present, a prize, a bribe or any other thing because they're no longer going to be part of the machine so they can't force them to stay? What's going on? Why can't they say, come on, stay? Well, I think um, uh, for a number of reasons that Michael and both um, uh, uh, make articulated, um, uh, because... You can only have, uh, I think, that amount of power over somebody if there is something to uh, to benefit from. And right. I think, look, in the run-up to Easter, no one's going to remember James Heapy and uh, Rob Halford making this announcement. Everyone will be having a nice Easter afterwards, so this story will come and go. Yeah. There'll be other people who resign for personal reasons. Um, there'll be people who resign, like Chris Skidmore, on policy issues. Now, that's when it becomes difficult when you've got somebody actually attacking government policy mm. on the government benches to say, right, I'm off now because I don't have any trust or faith in the government anymore. That is a real challenge. And, and there's no loyalty to card to play here? You know, we've been in this together for all these years, mate, so come on, chum. Stick well, around a bit longer, stick around till the bitter end. Don't walk out like this. This is a bit of a well, flouncy prima donna-ish thing to do. Just don't do it. Well, I mean, I, I suspect that uh, Robert Halfon's got quite a personal vote in Harlow, given his campaigns over mm. the years. And by standing down, he, he's making it that much harder exactly. for the Conservative parties to win that seat and for his successor, wh whoever that is. Yes. There's another consideration here as to timing as when you, you announce it. Uh, it's very difficult these days for M retired MPs and retired ministers uh, to get jobs afterwards, believe it or not. And it's perhaps easier in a way if you announce it now, then they know that that they, they can concentrate on looking for a new job and that they're advertising they will be available. Some people might say, well, Robert Halfon, mm. uh, you know, he held a, a ministerial office mm. covering the universities. He was chairman of the Education Select Committee. Uh, there's just a job for him. Why don't we approach him now? Mm. Whereas when there's the mad rush after the general election, uh, he may face a lot more competition. Yeah, let me bring Charlie <laughs> I, I, I think, that, I think that, that, that is the case, but the slight counter to that is that if Robert Hanford goes now, as he does, and he has got that massive personal vote, yeah. he's got enough time to now 
pick a, have a successor put in, and Robert will campaign with whoever the new Conservative yes. candidate is, and that new uh, candidate will get as much of a, uh, a hearsay a from the electorate than, than Robert just going at the last minute, a new person coming in and allowing the electorate to say, yes, I did vote for Robert for many, many years. I don't know who the next, next candidate is, so I'm going to vote Labour. If you're out with Robert on the doorstep, knowing who Robert was, and he can give him, oh, oh her, whoever the candidate is, his support, Robert's support, and that could actually help win the seat. Mike Buckley, this idea that Michael Crick has just posited that, that it's hard for these distinguished um, uh, former ministers to get a gainful employment afterwards, I would have thought they'd be snapped up with all those fantastic directorships and all those boardroom sinecures and all those, what are those things, those quangos? I've always been dying to be co-opted onto a quango and get paid <laughs> an enormous amount of money. For, <laughs> still hasn't happened. I'm available for all quangos. I never know what they mean, but I'd love to be on <laughs> one. But aren't they, aren't they, isn't that just I'm a sure kind you'd of, be quite good I'm, on a quango. I'm the <laughs> I really, go on, put in a word with whoever it is. I just don't know the, the right people. You're all for see all the wrong people. But the, the, the thing is, I would have thought, I think most people no. watching and listening to this would have thought that this was a magnificent passport to boardrooms and tremendous lunches and an absolutely but lavish it, it style does, of life forever. It does forever. vary, actually. Some of them do move on to the boardrooms and the directorships and, as you say, the Quangos and they go on to national speaking tours. Yeah. I mean, Boris Johnson and Theresa May, I think, are making... A lot yeah. of money going on to national speaking stores. How much would you pay to reason may not to make a speech? Fortune, I'd but save up that one. Some of them do struggle. Yeah. And actually, I will say one thing in favour of the resigners is if they did actually go on to fight the election as a candidate and lose, they get a payout from the state. Mm. And by announcing that they're not going to stand and they're not standing as a candidate, they are foregoing that money, which of course means that's a bit of money that is left in the state's coffers to pay for nurses, doctors, you know, and all the things that actually benefit us. Mm. So, uh, in a, you know, it, it's a small clap for them for doing, in a way, the right thing. All right, Michael, let's talk about the Liaison Committee. Rishi Sunak hasn't been up before it since December. He's there now, he's just been there, being quizzed on Rwanda, among other things. Um, does he, did he put up a creditable uh, job? Did he make good fist of things? What went on? I'm sorry. Yeah. I you were not it. glued? I can't believe that. You weren't fascinated by well, every... Well, all I can say is God, I have watched lasses. the Liaison Committee a yeah. lot of times in the past with Prime Ministers, mm -hmm. and I generally find it a complete waste of time. Uh, but has, the, has he said anything? <laughs> <laughs> has, he, has he said anything interesting? I doubt it. I don't know. I don't yeah. think it depends on whether he says anything <laughs> interesting. We're meant to listen whether it's boring as hell or not. <laughs> what about China? This is the crucial yeah. thing. Well, I hope he was asked about China because that obviously he is was asked about China. A, hu a huge story right yes. now. And the whole the whole story about the the Chinese stealing the electoral uh, register, that in itself I don't think is a is the world's greatest problem. I mean, it, you know, it wasn't that long ago, 12 years ago or so, you could actually buy a CD-ROM, <laughs> if anybody remembers what they... that was, a disc of the whole electoral register. A and what? A, a what was a, that? A, a, a <laughs> computer disc <laughs> of the whole electoral register. And, uh, and it was terribly useful to me as a journalist and I was bought a new one every year. And you had a, everybody's a, address and so on and their phone numbers too. Um, and you can get this information from libraries. I think two problems are here. One is... There are much more, it's the more insidious stuff that we don't know about. If they're doing that, what else are they doing? And of course, in the digital age, it's so much easier for you to do things quickly. Uh, you know, in the old days, to assemble that information, you would have had to go around every library in the country and write out the whole of the electoral register. Now it can best be done uh, like that. But more worrying than that, I would say, is the weakness of many of our institutions right now, notably the political parties, it would be relatively easy for, say, the Russians or the Chinese, if they did it over a number of years, to basically infiltrate our political parties and get their people... With, in with personnel, quite... you mean? Yes. I think you could get... Uh, if, uh, if, you did, if you did it properly, you could get your people into Parliament as, uh, as a Russian MP... I mean, nominally for one of the parties, better not be better be careful which ones I mention, mm -hmm. um, because there are so few people take part in the selection processes. The Conservative Party has got very few members these days. Mm -hmm. Some of their candidates have been chosen by meetings of ten or twenty people, and if you if they went about it properly, well organised. Mm -hmm. You could, you, they could run an amazing operation in this country. Oh, if they're thinking long term. A sense of John Le Carre exactly, coming on exactly. immediately. Yeah. Mike, uh, is this far fetched? Is uh, this well, true? It seems a little far fetched to me. I, mean, I don't know about the Conservative Party, actually. Charles will be able to tell us. But I know the Labour Party has very, very robust systems and procedures in place to vet candidates. Now, that did noticeably fail with Asahar Ali a few weeks ago when it came to Rochdale. But that's a standout example, and it's a standout because it did fail. 
But by and large, they've been through everybody's social media, they've been through their work history, they've been through everything. But for them, for their perspective, they want candidates that are going to be decent candidates, going to vote the right way, they're going to be loyal to Keir Starmer. But of course, I'm sure they're also checking out that they're not Russian spies. So I do think this is a little fantastical, if I'm quite honest. I do not believe there's anybody in the Labour Party checking whether candidates are Russian spies. How do you do that? And what is really ought to worry the Labour Party is they've gone to a system of online voting. Uh, for, for, the ch for choosing their candidates. It's the easiest thing in the world for the Chinese to sign up new members. They could do it from Beijing. Sign up new members of the Labour I Party. I feel a column coming on, Michael. Yeah, I, I really do. I feel a column. <laughs> this is how it all started. This is how it all started. We've seen like how the online... Having been one of the people yeah. who managed member data in a constituency Labour Party, mm. that is not Well, look what happened in Croydon East. We're always the aware of what the numbers are. What is happening in Croydon East? And we're when people join. We contact those new people to make sure that they're real. Partly to encourage them to come to meetings and go to go campaigning. But if they don't pick up the phone and say, yes, I'd like to come, no, I wouldn't like to come, it's going to be perfectly obvious. Again, perfectly obvious if they answer a Russian accent or a Chinese what? accent. What did happen well, in Croydon East? Well, Croydon East, the Metropolitan Police, uh, this has had very little coverage, this story, and it mm -hmm. should have had decent coverage. The Metro... and Because it, it's... There are a lot of people in the Labour Party who think it's gone on elsewhere as well. Mm -hmm. What happened in Croydon East is that somebody went into the membership uh, database and changed the postal addresses or the phone numbers or the email addresses of uh, around 120 members. Mm. Uh, they also uh, cast, at least 30 votes were cast in the selection process uh, fraudulently on behalf of members without those members' knowledge. Now, this is being investigated by the Inve Information Commissioner and now the Metropolitan Police. And there are strong suspicions this has gone elsewhere, on elsewhere. Now, if somebody can do it in, in London, it doesn't take much more for Putin or she or their henchmen to, to, to get involved, to start interfering, causing, causing trouble uh, on, 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 in, in a similar manner. I would give Charlie the, Rowley a chance the, to speak, the, but I'm not convinced... The, I'm not convinced he's not a Russian spy. The, I, don't know, I don't know what I'm not the, even sure I was asking silent, him anything the anyway. Silent the silent assassin Russian spy just worth pointing that out. <laughs> I'm the silent assassin in the middle here. But, um, look, there are two... Um, uh, whether or not, you know, it could come to pass that you get an MP in that position, what we do know, mm -hmm. through two very cl uh, clear examples, where you do have people from Russia and from China, I think somebody was working in Barry Gardner's office yep. who had to leave, and somebody was working for the Tory, I think it was the vice chair of the uh, Defence Select Committee or Foreign Affairs Committee, who had access Quite to... Quite a convenient doctors. place well, if you're a spy, isn't it? They Excellent. were working in parliamentary yeah. offices. They weren't necessarily MPs, but they weren't vetted in the way maybe in which, you know, you do vet uh, people at, at constituency level in terms of members. And so but they were working in the House of Commons. They were working... In We've got two people from Russia and China, spies that were there. So it's happening. And it's happened in the past. It was well known that there were MPs, mostly Labour, in the House in the 50s and during the Cold War, who were agents, uh, the Soviet agents or Chinese... Uh, Czech agents, uh, and it's only dribbled out uh, mm. over the years. Uh, but it could be done on a much bigger scale. And the weaker your political parties get, the fewer genuine members and genuine uh, checks and balances there are. And if you encourage online stuff, then the more this will happen. Where you require people to turn up and cast their votes, yeah. it's less likely to happen. I'd like to say thank you to Smiley's people. You've been excellent. <laughs> excellent this afternoon. You've really been absolutely hilarious, the whole conversation. I don't know how worried anybody watching or listening should be or could be, but I wouldn't trust a word that any of the three of them thank have you. said all afternoon. <laughs> this is what is coming up after the break. Kate Garraway shares how she was left with huge debts as a result of her late husband's daily care needs. I'm Vanessa Feltz. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smartphone. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, 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 treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge 
Quite right Yay. too. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to it was have moved another on from era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. TV presenter Kate Garraway says the cost of care for her late husband, Derek Draper, has left her with enormous debts. The Good Morning Britain presenter acknowledges she does have a well-paid job, but says she and her family have been left at crunch point due to medical and care expenses. Kate has revealed that it cost around £16,000 a month, which is much more than her ITV salary, to care for her husband, Derek Draper, who died in January, age 56, from the long term effects of COVID. Joining me now to discuss this, NHS GP Dr Ellie Cannon. Dr Cannon, thank you so much for joining me. I think people will be astounded at the cost of £16,000 a month and they will wonder why, if Derek Draper needed round-the-clock care for so many different issues and problems and concerns, why he wasn't in a hospital, why he was at home being cared for at Kate Garraway's expense and his own, rather than in hospital being cared for by the NHS at their expense? Well, this is, this is the difference between the care system and the NHS. So a hospital is not providing care. Hospitals provide treatment, um, and obviously included within that is care. But in terms of long-term care, um, that is provided by social care, which for most people is provided either privately through their own funds, as Kate has spoken about, or through the social care budgets, which actually come from the councils from the boroughs where you live. Yes. So that isn't actually coming from the NHS, although obviously the two do work together. So there wouldn't be the facility for somebody um, like Derek to have been in hospital per se. There may have been the facility for him to have been in some sort of care home um, but obviously the family choice was there for him to be in his own home, which was right for them. So that's where the costs were coming from. And, and, and so if he had been Derek Draper in different circumstances, so let's say, for example, he had been a single man with no one to care mm. for him, mm. or, he, or he had been um, either on benefits or unemployed or earning very little or from a family with very little money at all, what happens then? So that scenario will be very familiar to people. So I look after patients who are in that exact scenario and they are looked after by the social care system. So that may mean 
um, a state funded um, care home, either uh, residential care, nursing care, that type of thing, or having live in carers or four or six times a day carers within his own home, which would have been paid for by the local um, social care budget. And, and, so, and so it's decided, is it, that on an income-based uh, system, you either do have you know, kind of full access to whatever social care can provide or you pay yourself and the costs are absolutely exorbitant. I mean, you might say prohibitive, but Kate Garraway obviously wanted her husband to be at home and she wanted to be there caring for him and providing the care that he needed. But she's, she's said to be in something like £800,000 worth of debt. Mm. Yeah, so there's, it's not all means tested. So people with significant disabilities, as Derek had, are entitled to certain things that are not means tested. For example, things like attendance allowance, things like um, DLA, and the care that is provided if somebody has those needs would not be means tested. But obviously, in terms of what people want and what people sort of have the right to choose is obviously going to be different on the basis of how much money people have and they can sort of lay out and depending what the, the family want to do. Um, but I mean, this isn't surprising to me. Um, I looked after a family member last year um, who was in residential care for dementia um, and the costs are absolutely staggering. They're absolutely staggering, phenomenal. You can't even imagine along the lines of what Kate is talking about. And, and, and so, and so when, when we hear of, of patients staying in hospital beds that really should be vacated for patients because mm. the social care structure mm. system, you know, facility is somehow not in place for them to be able to mm. leave hospital, is this partly what we're talking about? This is absolutely partly what we're talking about, the resources in terms of the finances, but also the resources in terms of the people to do the caring or the space within facilities if somebody is going to a care home or a nursing home. So absolutely, this is this is sort of like the type of thing and is something that unfortunately as a country, as a society, we don't invest in, we don't pay um, carers a huge amount of money. All of these things cost a lot of money in terms of the paraphernalia, the equipment. Anybody who saw Kate's programme saw just how much equipment and stuff was in their house that Derek needed just to survive on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but absolutely, this is part of the, the patient journey through hospital. And Doctor, I just want to ask you about the COVID jab that I believe today has become available on the high street, but only if you can pay for it. Yes, that's right. So just like people can pay for a flu jab in the local um, chemists and local high streets and supermarkets, you're now going to be able to go to one of the big high street chemists and buy a Pfizer COVID vaccine, quite a lot more expensive, I have to say. I think it's in the region of £90 um, compared to a flu jab, which is normally around 10 or 15 But people can opt into a COVID vaccine uh, over the age of 12, um, I think from next month, from April. And who are the people that you think should avail themselves of this if they have the £30? Because the people who are most at risk have been given the jab free in the normal manner, haven't they? So who are the people that you think should take advantage of this if they possibly can? Well, I say sort of the same thing that I would say about flu jabs, which is really for a lot of people, it's very inconvenient to be ill. Um, so I've always had a lot of patients over the years who have opted into getting a flu jab, even though um, they're not considered vulnerable. People who um, are very busy, self-employed people who wouldn't get sick pay. You've got lots of nice holidays coming up. You don't want one ruined by having COVID or flu. And I think it's the same thing. Um, people don't want to be ill. They might have been ill quite badly previously with COVID, don't want to go through that again. Got a busy year coming up, lots of things happening. You just might not want to have the inconvenience of having COVID. And you know when you get the flu jab, there's always this kind of uh, caveat, which is um, it might not prevent the strain of flu that happens to be the prevalent mm. one this year, but have it anyway because just in case kind of thing. It's mm. not the same with COVID, is it? If you have the COVID jab, you really shouldn't get COVID, or if you get it, it shouldn't be severe. Is that right? 
Well, we did have these different strains, didn't we? And obviously they've had to put one specific strain within within the COVID vaccine, the Pfizer one. So I'm not entirely sure how they are going to be updating that, but one would hope that it is the most recent COVID um, vaccine from the season that we've drawn, gone through that we've given our vulnerable patients. Um, so it's be the same one that is the most recent circulating strain. So hopefully, um, actually prevent COVID for people, and if not prevent, at least attenuate or minimise the infection somebody gets. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for joining us, Doctor. Coming up after the break, Papa John's, or rather, Papa Gone. The pizza giant announces it'll close nearly a tenth of its restaurants here in the UK. I'm Vanessa Feltz, and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Is a Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put the Statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, to put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. Yeah, it was, it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. The family favourite pizza chain Papa John's is set to close nearly a tenth of its UK restaurants, which it says are underperforming. 43 of the 450 restaurants will shut within the next two months, with no indication of how many jobs will be hit. Closures follow a review of the business, which identified sites that were no longer financially viable. Joining me to discuss this, pizza chef consultant Marco Fuso. Marco, thank you so much for joining me. I think people will be amazed because pizza is so popular. It's very cheap because its ingredients are so basic. I think they'll wonder how it can be that a well-known pizza chain cannot be profitable. Hi, Vanessa. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Uh, well, that's a good question. The, I think as a consultant, I have lots of business, lots of startup. 
So I believe that when you increase the number of the outlets out there, there will be always some of the shops that will not perform like others. And I can understand the uh, strategy that Papa John's is using by shutting down few of them, few, well, they're not few actually, uh, to try to save in some money and maybe invest um, those, that money uh, to the shops that are doing well. But pizza is basic, isn't it? It's not a lavish, extravagant dish with all sorts of rare ingredients that have to be sourced all over the world. We're talking about basic flour, a basic tomato paste, fairly basic. Jeez, it's not a, a big stretch to make. It's not expensive to make. So how can something the way you think that, you know, the upselling potential is so great because it costs so few pence to make and you can sell for so many pounds, you think that is the perfect model for a profitable business. That's the very key to a great business, isn't it? Where the product costs almost nothing, but the markup is huge. Well, it is. And that shows us the number of uh, independent pizzeria nowadays that are out there on the ice street as well. I think that uh, if Papa John's is not performing uh, like the past, this is due to the number of new independent restaurants that nowadays have more knowledge in terms of using the best ingredients and serve the perfect pizza. Um, obviously, pizza is very profitable, and everyone would like to get a slice of that in the business too. Well, Marco, always a great pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for joining us and enlightening us. On the pizza front, I'm joined now by the exquisite Ian Collins and the utterly charming JJ Anasiobi. How lovely to see you, gentlemen. Can I just say, Vanessa, yes. on the back of that, my, the greatest horror, I have nightmares about this, what? would be the idea of the KFC closing. Imagine it. Can you imagine? <laughs> no, I don't even want to talk. I don't want to think about it. One of the it. Colonel's chicken parlours well, would go by the life wayside. Life without a bargain bucket. Come on. I, I mean, come for on. goodness sake. Don't. So, I've heard of broken Thank goodness Britain. it was just a couple of pizzas. No, this is, <laughs> this is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. What's coming up on your show? The ridiculousness about yeah. Prince Harry being associated with P. Diddy and this huge lawsuit that's uh, engulfing him. It's incredible how the, the, there is a connection here. I mean, tenuous as it is in legal terms. But yes. this is all about how P. Diddy felt... Um, legitimised because of his connection with Harry. But, I mean, how blah, do we know blah, whether blah. it was a real connection or well, just one all, photo? It's all we don't know. It was just was the, Oh, the other one was about Joey Barton, wasn't it? Joey Barton, you know, the foot, former footballer yeah. who can't stop himself on social media when yeah. it comes to women's football... He's been at it again. Well, he's, he's saying if you're a woman and you play badly, you should be criticised. And I agree with him. What's wrong with that? If you play bad, be criticised, male or female. If you're it's a woman, be you're being criticised so roundly it's anyway for so many other things. Oh, That's here why. we go. That's just got why. An odd way of <laughs> doing well, very sadly, not not of course. We've come to the end of the show. The talk is coming up next. Thanks for tuning in. Have a wonderful evening. Lots of love. A very good night. Good night. Good morning, it's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Today on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man.
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. floor.